Welcome to Kerbalsville Alliance online stream this morning. We're glad that you can join us. I'm Steve. I'm the pastor here. And uh, we're planning to do some worship today. We're going to sing a little bit. I'm going to share from God's word. And uh, we're going to sing again. We'll pray together. I think it'll be a meaningful time for you. I hope that you'll stick with us throughout because I believe that God can bless you. Good morning, everyone. Let's worship God this morning. Steve, I'm the pastor at Kerwinsville Alliance Church. One of the neatest things in the world is that back in January, the first Sunday of January, I started a sermon series on lids. And in that sermon series, the sermon that is due today, on this day, is the lid of fear. It feels almost like God knew this was coming, doesn't it? <laughs> and that he was preparing us for it. I wonder if you would unite your heart with me in prayer. We'll ask him to bless our time together. Father in heaven, we're glad to be here around these devices, being able to hear from you and speak to you. 
Holy Spirit, I pray you would be in our hearts and help our attention to focus on what you might want to say. Jesus, where two or three are gathered, you're there. We are gathered. We know you're here. We trust you, Father, to show us your love. Show us your love in ways that we might not have seen it before so that we would not fear. We pray this with confidence in you, in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So if you'd like to, I would encourage you to open your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. That's an Old Testament book. We're going to be in chapter 9. And I would ask you, uh, if you have a Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app, to look for an event. Click the menu and look for an event. You might have to type in Kerwinsville and find the Kerwinsville Alliance Church event, and you can follow along. Some of you will know as soon as I say the words Dick and Morris, who I'm talking about. They had a really good thing going in 1940. They were making, in 1940, $50,000 a year. Each of them were. These two brothers were making that kind of money when, when the average income for a guy like them was less than $1,000 a year. 50 times what everyone else was making. They had this great little business going. They were proud of it. They even gave it their own last name. They called it McDonald's. And in the years that they controlled McDonald's, Dick and Morris sold franchises for that restaurant to 15 people. Only 10 of those franchises actually opened restaurants. And that's kind of where it ended for them. They had reached their limit. They had kind of hit a lid, so to speak, that kept them from advancing further. Then along came a guy named Ray Kroc. In 1998, in 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, John Maxwell wrote this about what happened to McDonald's. The leadership lid in Ray Kroc's life was sky high. Between 1955 and 1959, Kroc succeeded in opening 100 restaurants. Four years after that, there were 500 McDonald's. And today, now remember he's writing in 98, there are over 31,000 restaurants in 119 countries. Now here's what's important. Maxwell says this, leadership ability, or more specifically, the lack of leadership ability, was the lid on the McDonald's brothers' effectiveness. Lids, they can hold you down. Lids can actually keep you from being the person that God wants you to be. And that's kind of what we're talking about. I was at a conference uh, probably 25 years ago where John Maxwell was speaking about this very thing, the law of the lid. And the example that he gave was a man named Saul because he was speaking about the lid of fear. Saul, son of Kish. Saul was Israel's first king. He was a warrior. But he was held back from being everything that God had in mind for him to be because of the lid of fear. Now, we've talked about a lot of lids. Some of them have been relevant to you. Some of them may not have been. But I'm guessing that this is maybe the most relevant of all the lids. Throughout our lives, we tend to struggle with fear. And we especially tend to struggle with it during a time like this when we're facing the coronavirus. I see it all the time. People afraid of getting sick. People afraid of losing loved ones. What's going to happen to the economy? I'm out of toilet paper. <laughs> we see all those things, and all of them boil down to fear, something commonplace in our lives, and especially so today. Now, if you've been paying any time, I'm sorry, if you've been paying any attention at all in the time you've been in church, you've probably noticed the most common command in the Bible is, fear not. It makes me chuckle when say, people say, the Bible's just not relevant today. What could be more relevant to us? that instruction, fear not, and how can we avoid fear? What I want to do is I want to kind of talk you through a little bit of 1 Samuel and the story of Saul. So you're going to have to stick with me. This is going to be something that um, will kind of meet out the, the good stuff here as we move along. We're introduced to Saul in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. He's described as a tall, handsome man. He has everything going for him, and he meets the prophet Samuel. Samuel gives him an honor and when Samuel actually gives him that honor, when he shows him that honor, 
And Saul's response is kind of strange. Saul says, but I am a Benjaminite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least in all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing about me? Now, that might have been humility, but it might have been fear. We'll see what you think as we move on. Let's move to the next passage. I would encourage you to turn to 1 Samuel 10. We're going to look at verse 22 in a second here. The people of the Lord are gathered together at a place called Mizpah, and God is going to reveal to all of them what he has in mind as their leader, who he has in mind for their leader. So imagine with me, the 12 tribes of Israel are all there. Thousands of people are standing there before the Lord. And the Lord says, uh, these 11 tribes, he one at a time, he says, not this one, not this one, not this one, until he comes to the tribe of Benjamin. So there's all the men of the tribe of Benjamin. Am I going to be the leader? Am I going to be the king? And Samuel goes through all the clans, not this clan, not this clan, not this clan. And then it comes down to the clan of Mitri. That's a pretty small clan. Paul, Saul already said, it's the smallest in the tribe of Benjamin. And then when they go through that, and they're deciding all of this by lot, when they go through that, they finally come to the son of Kish. Saul is chosen. But when they looked for him, he's missing. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Saul has been told ahead of time that he is going to be the king. Samuel came and told him, you're going to be the leader. And now he's at his coronation, but he's not able to be found. He's AWOL. Look at what chapter 10 verse 22 says. It says, so they inquired further of the Lord, has this man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes. He has hidden himself among the supplies. Yeah. Are you still thinking it might be humility? I'm not. I'm pretty confident that it's fear that is active in Saul's life. There are other places you see it. His jealousy concerning David, his failure with the Amalekites, and a story we're going to read in chapter 13. So turn in your Bibles now to 1 Samuel 13. We're going to pick up right after Saul has kind of picked a fight with the Philistines. Beginning in verse 5. Follow along as I read. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw their situation was critical and their own army was hard pressed, they hid in the caves and the thickets among the rocks and the pits and the cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained in Gilgal, and all his troops with him were quaking with, and here's that word, fear. Fear. So what they're waiting on, they're waiting on God's prophet Samuel to come and offer a burnt offering to secure God's blessing. Verse 8 said, they waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and a fellowship offering. So Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistine will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord, your God, the command the Lord, your God, gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Wow. <laughs> the very thing that Saul feared was something that Saul feared, Saul's fear brought to pass. Now, there are a lot of reasons, and many of them are legitimate, why people have this lid of fear in their life. One reason is because of bad experiences. You can think of them as well as I can. Maybe experiences with failure would cause you to fear. Do you know people who failed in one area of life and said, I'm never trying that again? Maybe they failed in romance, and they never dated again. That's a lid, fear. Or maybe they failed in business, and they never tried again. That's a lid, fear. 
Or maybe they failed sharing their faith. They wanted to tell someone how they could have peace with God through Jesus, and they tried and they failed and they never tried again. There's that lid, fear. Experiences can become a lid in our life. So can experiences not just with failure, but experiences with abuse. I mean, most of us have seen dogs that have suffered abuse and the way they kind of duck their head. Have you ever seen a person like that? Maybe you've been that person. It's important to note that abuse doesn't have to come in the horrible, aggressive form that we imagine when we hear that term. Abuse can be almost passive sometimes, maybe the abuse of neglect. And it can bring into our hearts a sense of fear, bad experience. It can leave us under a lid of fear. Another reason have people have this lid is we kind of struggle to trust God. We have trust issues in our life. Let me give you an example. This sounds kind of crazy. Maybe some of you will think, yeah, that kind of feels like me. There was a season in my life, and I want to tell you it was years, that every time I walked out to the mailbox and opened the mailbox and started to leaf through the mail, I had a sense of fear. I would hold my breath as the mail was uh, kind of flipping through my hand and I'm looking at it because I dreaded some bad news coming. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that goes back to when uh, I had an algebra teacher that used to send home letters to my parents about me not doing my homework. I don't know if it was that or what, but there it was in my life. I had fear reigning in such a trivial, trivial area as the mail. Now, I know there are many things in my past that probably contributed to that, but I can't change the things of my past. What I could change and what I have changed is my present. I can choose to fear or I can choose to trust because trusting God, that's a choice. And not trusting him, that's a lid. Here's a third reason that we have this lid. And that is because sometimes we feel that God calls us to do the impossible. We all experience it. Moments when we feel like we just can't keep going. The bills keep coming in and the email. You're, I don't want to check my email because there's going to be another bill there. Or I don't want to check my mail. There's going to be another bill there. God, I am afraid that I just can't handle this. Or the doctor comes up and says, we're going to need to do more tests. God, I don't think I can go through more tests. I, I'm afraid I can't do that. Or that person says, I just don't love you anymore. God, I am afraid of how I'm going to deal with this in my life. Let's be honest. Sometimes it feels like the path that God has laid out for us is one that cannot be followed. And that is frightening to us. It was frightening to Saul. I mean, if you look at chapter 13, a verse we didn't read is verse 2. And it kind of lets us know the odds are really stacked against Saul here. Verse 2 says, Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 to be with him in Michmash and the hill country and Bethel and 1,000 with Jonathan and Gabeah and, ben and Benjamin. And the rest of them he sent back to their homes. So he's got 3,000 foot soldiers. Do you remember in verse 5 how many Philistines there were? <laughs> verse 5, 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. No wonder Saul was afraid. And sometimes it seems that God asks us to do the impossible. And we struggle with fear. And that fear in our lives is definitely a lid. There are many ways that fear is a lid. Maybe too many to count. One thing that fear does is it damages our relationship. I never get the sense when I'm reading about Saul and Samuel that they, uh, that they are buddies. <laughs> Their relationship always seems strained uh, right, after, right after he becomes king. Fear creates what we call a fight or flight mentality. You're either going to put up your fists or you're going to turn up your heels and run. Fear can make you explosive. Do you know people that when they're afraid, they have that kind of hair trigger temper? They're like a gun that doesn't have a safety, that's cocked, and it's got a hair trigger. And you're just afraid to be around it. Someone might get hurt. Or maybe another illustration is a person who fear makes them like an enraged gorilla, tearing everything up. Nobody wants to be around that person and relationships are damaged. If fear doesn't make you explosive, if it doesn't make you fight, it can make you withdrawn. It can make you like a mouse, wanting to hide from everyone and everything, avoiding meaningful conversation and, and missing out on genuine relationships and 
and real companionship because you're afraid and you withdraw and relationships are damaged. Fear is a lid. It damages relationship and it actually prevents you from accomplishing what God might have in mind for you. There are certain things in this world God has for you to do, but fear, fear may keep you from doing those very things. It can prevent you from seeing what God has in mind for you to do and how God is going to accomplish that. That's a little bit of what happened with Saul. You know, we read about what happened to him when he went out, out of fear to make that sacrifice, a sacrifice that wasn't his to make. And do you remember? Look at verse 13 again and listen to what Samuel says to him. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you if you had. He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Fear kept Saul from being the person that God wanted him to be. That is a very definition of a lid. And fear can actually blind you to what God is doing. (laughs) Talk about timing. I mean, sometimes I really pity Saul in this passage. Saul jumps the gun. He offers a burnt offering. And and there's a part of me that doesn't blame him. Samuel, you said you'd be here. Where are you? And the very next verse, after it tells us that Saul offered the burnt offering, the very next verse says, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. Wow. So Samuel, as as he's coming onto the scene, He sees the smoke. He smells the burnt offering. For Saul, there is no hiding what he has done. And you may wonder, how could Saul not know that Samuel was coming? I don't know. Someone may counter, how would he have known that Samuel was coming? And I want to say, I think it might be a matter of spiritual eyesight. Spiritual eyesight. You see, the eyes of fear seldom see solutions. The eyes of fear do not beam with hope. The eyes of fear are not brimming with optimism. And so Saul, looking through the eyes of fear, would not have seen Samuel coming. The eyes of faith, they're different. The eyes of faith, they never focus on despair. The eyes of faith don't dart around in panic looking for, ha, how can I fix this? The eyes of faith They see solutions. They see God's solution. And just as God's solution was coming for Saul, I want to say to you, God has a solution that is coming for you and coming for me. But fear? Fear might blind us to seeing that solution. So let's talk about it. How do we remove this lid of fear? How do we do that? I'd like to remove the lid of fear. Let me tell you this. The first thing you're going to need to do is something you're not going to want to do. You're going to have to admit you're afraid. Admit you're afraid. I will tell you that I have been afraid. One time, probably 30 years ago, I was afraid that I actually had shown some fear, but I really hadn't, so it was a miss. I wasn't. No, I've always been afraid. All of us struggle with fear. Not just 30 minutes ago, 30 years ago, 30 minutes ago. It is common to us. Common to us. It was common to Saul. I've got to wonder, sometimes I like to use my imagination and think, how many things have played out differently for people in the Bible? Like Saul. What if Saul had stopped just as he was ready, just as he was ready to offer that burnt offering? What if he had stopped and, and thought about what he was doing? And what if he would have seen himself, that he was a man who was acting in panic, in fear, I don't know, maybe that could have been a whole new start, a major life change in his life path. Self-awareness, being aware of what's going on in your heart and in your mind, that is really the starting place for effective change in your life. Are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Sickness? Loss of income? Loss of family members? Loss of your retirement? Okay, admit it. Because if you hide it, if you deny it to yourself, it will always be there. 
but it will never be resolved. Fear is like that half gallon of milk <laughs> that fell down between the seat and the trunk in the car. And at first it wasn't a problem, but after it stayed there for a few hot summer days, well, it was hidden, <laughs> but everyone knew it was there, and it was a major problem. If you are afraid, it's going to show up. So admit it so that you can begin to remove it. And when you've admitted it, you're going to need to change your thinking pattern. When fear becomes your common response in life, you probably have fallen into a pattern that is anything but godly. Fight or flight, take your pick. Neither one of those are Christ-like. And both are very much characteristic of the world in which we find ourselves. And if you haven't noticed, this world is a little bit of a train wreck. <laughs> I mean, I love it. God loves this world. But let's not pretend that anyone knows how to fix it except for God. It's hard enough to get humanity to even agree on what's wrong with it. And so with that in mind, let me ask you this question. Do you want this world system to give you the pattern, the algorithm, for how you should think about things? Really? The Bible says in Romans 12 too, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me ask you, what thinking pattern have you picked up that you need to put down? The answer to that question will help you put your finger on the pulse of your fear. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ask God to tweak your brain a little bit. Ask him to turn it from the pattern of this world to his pattern. And as you do that, align your mind with the mind of Christ. You know, lots of people like John 8, 32. It's one of those verses that's an aphorism that Jesus says, and we remember it, it has power, it has impact. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Love that verse. It's a great verse. It, it, it's freeing. But don't miss the verse right before that one. Right before John 8, 32 you find at the end of John 8, 31, these words coming from Jesus. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Did you hear Jesus' qualifier? Knowing the truth, that's not what sets you free. I can know the truth about addiction and remain in bondage to alcohol and other drugs. I can know the truth that it's more blessed to give than to receive and remain in bondage to selfishness. I can know the truth that says, I need not fear for God is with me and I can still remain in bondage to fear. So how do I get out of that? Hold to Jesus' teaching. Over and over again, people like you and me ask uh, questions about our fear. We struggle with anxiety. We, we find it difficult sometimes to experience joy. We find ourselves overwhelmed with worries. And we wonder, why can't we be free of these? Let me just state the obvious. You will never be the person God wants you to be if you do not align your thinking with Jesus' way of thinking. And you will always live in fear and the truth will never set you free from it until you align your mind with the mind of Christ. And aligning your mind with Jesus is not rocket science. It is simply living as Jesus lived, as he instructed us to live. Are you afraid to love someone? Align your view of love with Jesus' view of love. Greater love has no one in this than he lay down one's life for a friend. And you'll be set free from fear. Are you afraid to forgive someone? Align your view of forgiveness with Jesus' view of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, 
he said from the cross, for they know not what they do. Align your thinking with that thinking and you'll be set free from fear. Are you afraid of the storm that you live in? Obsessing about COVID-19 maybe. Align your view of life with Jesus' view of life. In this world, you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, for I have overcome the world. And when you align your thinking with that thinking, the lid of fear begins to disappear. But it doesn't stop with aligning your mind with the mind of Christ. You need to discipline your mind as well. The human mind, that is a place that spiritual battlefields, spiritual battles rather, are fought. In his book, The Bondage Breaker, Neil Anderson made this remark. The 90-pound anorexic looks in a mirror and says, I'm fat. The legalist reads Matthew 23, where Jesus denounced the scribes and the Pharisees, but he can't see that he himself is no different than the scribes and the Pharisees. And in each of those cases, and uncounted other ones, the battleground is in the mind, and it is being lost. A package, a passage rather, a passage that connects well with this is found in 2 Corinthians 10, where the word of God says that the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Did you hear those words? We take captive every thought and make it obedient, obedient to Christ. So fear comes into your life, hold on to the truth, and take that fear captive. Make it obedient to Christ. The lie says, you're going to lose everything. I reject that lie, and I make it obedient to Christ. The lie says, your family will be taken from you. I reject that lie. I make it obedient to Christ. The lie says, your marriage is not worth saving. I reject that lie. And I make it obedient to Christ. The lie says, you can't overcome this temptation. Just go ahead. Cave in. Enjoy it. I reject that lie. I make it obedient to Christ. You understand, removing this lid means admitting you're afraid changing the pattern of your thinking, aligning your mind with the mind of Christ and disciplining your mind to reject, to reject fear. Because fear, it is a lid. And the only way to remove it is through your relationship with God. And honestly, that's a bit of what God is talking about throughout Scripture. He wants you to overcome fear and know that you are deeply loved. He says that perfect love casts out all fear. He wants you to know you do not need to fear when he is with you. And over and over again, he speaks to this. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 38, speaks to this powerfully. I want to close by reading it to you from the New Living Translation so you have kind of a fresh appreciation about it if you haven't read it from there before. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing. And all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus the Lord. Listen to me. If the God who made the universe loves you that way, then you don't need to fear anything. Let me, uh, let me pray for you. Let's bow our hearts together. Father, we come to you as little children, relying on you and who you are. We admit to you freely that sometimes life is scary. 
we admit our fear. But we will not allow the pattern of this world that is marked by panic and unrest to undo us. Rather, rather, Father, we want to change our way of thinking to align with Christ. To align with thinking that brings freedom. Thinking that removes fear. And so we reject anxiety. We embrace joy. We reject worries. We embrace confidence. We reject doubt. We embrace trust. We do this because we want to be the people that you have in mind for us to be. We trust you to make it happen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.